name's Chris Rodemaker. I'm the ISU Swine Extension Veterinarian. I'm a clinical professor at the ISU College of Vet Med and also the Associate Director of the Iowa Pork Industry Center. And today we're going to cover uh, four different health-related topics. We're going to talk about PERS. Uh, it wouldn't be a PERS season, so it wouldn't be a regional conference talk. We didn't talk about PERS still by far and away the most economically devastating disease that we see. And we're going to talk to you probably about the most current virus that's creating uh, the most uh, heartache and damage out in the industry. Uh, we're going to talk a little bit about what we're learning and seeing there, some tools that we have to be able to monitor that. We're going to talk a little bit about APP, one we don't talk a lot about, but we had a sudden resurgence in the north central part of the state, so we're going to talk a little bit about that. Uh, Thirdly, we're going to talk a little bit about F-18 E. coli. We're starting to see more and more cases of that. So we're going to talk a little bit about maybe why and some things you can do about that. And then I want to touch just one slide at the end about a program called U.S. SHIP. Uh, and you're just going to be hearing a lot more about that from Corey and his team over the next six months. And it really is kind of the next step as part of a national plan for FAD preparation. So I just want to talk to you a little bit about that. You're going to be hearing more about IPPAs. It's a pilot program that uh, IPPA is uh, going to help you guys get signed up in if you're interested to help get your sites registered. It doesn't cost you anything, but uh, certainly going to help uh, everybody, help the industry be more prepared when and if we get to the point where we have a foreign animal disease to get uh, our, our uh, trade and our industry back on its feet very, very quickly. So the neat part about my job is I get to share all the neat stuff that my colleagues do back at the college. So one of them is Giovanni Trevesan. So a bunch of these slides come from the swine disease reporting system. So all that information there is located at the website below. I just uh, collected a little bit of information to share with you guys today. So what Giovanni and his team did is they took all the information from these five diagnostic labs, Iowa State, Minnesota, South Dakota State, Kansas State, and Ohio State diagnostic lab. These probably do about 90 to 95 percent of the pig cases across the United States. And it takes all their diagnostic information, puts it together in one database, and then pulls uh, information out so we can look at different pathogens and we can look at prevalence and really kind of use it as a predictive tool to say, okay, so what are we seeing out in the industry? So here's an example of uh, some PERS monitoring we're able to do with that database. You can kind of see all the PERS cases that. Uh, uh, that we've looked at over the past five years. You can see them broken out on a weekly basis, looking at that database. And those sections in blue, that's kind of what we would see in a typical PERS season, right? So we kind of see a lot more cases in the winter, you know, spring and fall, and then it kind of goes down during the summertime period. Well, as soon as you see that any spikes go above or below that, we say something's different, something's changed. That's certainly what we saw at the end of 2020. And then again, in the spring and summer of 2021, you see those in the circles there. Something was different. We were seeing a lot more cases than what historically we would expect to see. So, and we were starting to hear that from practitioners as well, right? So we started to do a bunch of the genetic fingerprint sequencing. And lo and behold, we started to find a new strain that was uh, really becoming associated with some really high mortality in wheat and finish and some really nasty uh, outbreaks in south farms. And that was the one that we call this PERS 144 variant 1C that you see listed here. So like you said, we saw a few cases in 2020 in the fall and winter, and then really saw a surge in, in mostly in Minnesota and Iowa, a few in some of the, the surrounding states uh, bordering them, uh, but really saw it come to a head in kind of the spring and, and even into the summer, which is a little atypical. Uh, we really saw a lot of cases, and then uh, we saw a little, saw the cases dial back a little bit in August and September, and then kind of into the fall again this year as the weather got cool again and got into pumping season, and we really kind of saw that virus uh, really kind of rear its ugly head again. So just kind of a neat way to look at that uh, uh, specifically. So just to say that that one has kind of gotten to be the predominant one. So we're trying to understand why is this virus worse? What makes it different? Um, one of the things that we see with this though is we tend to see when these new viruses pop up, they kind of circulate in the uh, growing pig herds first before they get into the south farm. So that's what we're seeing here. And uh, what you're seeing here is this is the average CT value. So with a, with a PERS PCR test, it doesn't just tell you if they're negative or positive. 
they'll actually give you an idea of how positive it is. In other words, how much virus is in that sample. And how you got to look at that is it's a little bit backwards, right? So the lower number means the more virus that's actually in that sample, okay? So that's what you got to remember. The lower CT value means the more virus that's in there. And that's kind of what we saw. You can see actually, we started to see a dip there in the summer of 2020 and we need to finish babies. And then you can kind of see there in October, November, and December, and then the kind of the same thing repeat itself there all the way through 2021. And I think what we're starting to learn with that is if we get viruses that, uh, uh, if we find more virus in them, the more virus we find in these pigs means it's the, that much more virus that they can put out into the, into the air, uh, into the environment, which means it's a little bit easier for that virus to uh, escape. You know, if we got marginal virus security not doing a good job or gets in the air or however that virus gets out, it just means it's that much more transmissible. So this is another way of looking at it. Again, this is looking at it on a weekly basis. You can see the, the large number of cases there in the summer. And then you start to see it uh, kind of go quiet again in August and September until we got back into the cool fall season and then pumping season. We started to see the cases go back up. And then more recently, we haven't quite seen as many cases. So what they do is they go into that database and they look for just the ones uh, that sequence out as this variant L1C. So, that's kind of uh, the ability to be able to look at just that specific strain. So we went back and looked at, uh, historically, what, what do we see when we look at the percent positive cases? So we looked at over the last 12 years, we kind of look at it uh, in the fall, winter, spring, we look at it quarterly, right? And we see some you know, fluctuations, you know, we see the seasonal pattern where you see uh, a lower number of those, pers of those cases that come back at positive during the summer, we see higher ones in the fall and winter. Um, what's interesting about the one in 2013, 2014? That's probably the lowest one, right? We look at all those seasons there. What happened in that time frame there? Yeah, PED. So why do you think we had a lower number of uh, percentage of positive cases in those months? And that year? What's that? Big time. Well, yeah, it killed eight percent of them, but probably didn't affect the other ninety-two percent of them. So why do why do we think that those? What other reason might there be? Everybody was nervous about it, right? So what did they start doing? A better job. Biosecurity, right? So I looked at that, you know, as I was just kind of looking through this data for this preparation, and, and I've, I've got some other uh, really neat biosecurity, uh, girl finished biosecurity data to look at, but I did find that kind of funny to say, yeah, there's, you know, there's probably something that we can do there, right? You know, we were really nervous about it. We we're tightening things down, and yeah, we had a real impact there on, you know, the percentage of cases of first positive that year, and you kind of see, well, well, we probably got a little bit lax, particularly in that girl finished. You know, period. That's probably where we're still really vulnerable. And I've got some really neat data that a master's student is working on that I'll share with you here a little bit later to kind of show that's probably still one of our big areas of weakness is that growing pig biosecurity. So this is just kind of looking at the different uh, classes, the, these different viruses as they emerge over the years. You know, I remember in 2008, 2009, we were talking about the 118-2s, and then we started talking about 126-2s, and then we talked about the 174s in 2017, 2018, 2019, then it was the 184s, and now it's the 144s. So a little bit of, I think, of what we're seeing is, is probably the truest example of evolutionary biology, right? The better job that we've done with herd closures and you know, filtration in farms, all these things that we put into place to help uh, monitor and, and uh, try to control PERS, we're probably selecting for viruses that are uh, that could survive longer, that shed more, that affect pigs worse, right? So we're selecting for bigger, meaner, better, worse improved viruses. Not real great English there, I know, but I think that's a little bit of what we're seeing because I got a little bit of data to show you to say, you know, some of these herds, this very one C, it's, it's really pretty bad. So unfortunately, right? So we're hopefully, yeah, we you know, got to continue to work on really the new and better tools of what we've had before because. Uh, that's a little bit of what we're seeing. Here's a little bit of the production data. Dr. Yeski shared um, at the, uh, the McKean conference that we had in November of last year at Iowa State University from some farms uh, that, he, that him and his team worked with. I mean, you can see, you know, some of these herds, I mean, it's you know, about more than 150 up to 200 sows a week. 
know, furlong rates. You know, some farms didn't get hit quite as bad, but you know, some of these farms, you know, less than 50% for you know, a couple of months, right? Some of the farms that, you know, it took almost, you know, took a quarter's worth of, of uh, pharaohs, you know, right out before it even got back to normal. He said, you know, a lot of bumps they, they tended to see, but it looked like a normal PERS break, but, you know, some of these really got impacted just by the number of mummies that they had. But, you know, a really high pre weed mortality in some of these herds. You can see in some of them, you know, they were probably weeding a pig for two months, you know, 100% mortality for a really extended period of time. Some herds didn't get hit quite as bad, but, you know, a fair number of them certainly did. So when you start looking at how that impacts the, you know, total farm, you know, throughput, you know, some of those. Big, you know, farms didn't get back to anywhere near normalcy of production for you know almost a half a year or longer. So, you know, really, really uh, epidemic type uh, and, and long lasting, right? That's a little bit different. Normally, PERS breaks bad, but usually by about 20 weeks, you're somewhere back to normal production. And some of the herds they did get that, but other ones were really long and really extended before they got back to normal production. So, that's Another feature I think we're seeing as these newer strains tend to evolve is they just last a lot longer as well. And then on the, the downstream performance, that's I think that's a little bit what we're seeing too, is not only are they worse than breeding herds, the downstream performance is impacted as well. You can see before the outbreak, you know, a lot of the farms that they work with, you know, really good performance, less than 2%, nursery mortality before that. Uh, you know, during the outbreak, yeah, I kind of expect it to be, you know, pretty bad. You know, it's thirty percent mortality until the south farm got back to somewhat normal production. But even after the south farm looked like it was back to normal, you know, they still had really high nursery mortality, up to twelve percent for ten closes, you know, eleven closeouts after that. Even after the south farm looked like it was back to somewhat normal production, they still had high downstream losses. So, just a really, really tough virus to deal with. So we had a researcher, probably you know, one of the best virologists we're really lucky to have in the world is at Iowa State. He uh, was able to get a grant from Iowa Pork Producers Association. He wanted to look at this new 144 strains and uh, 144, that, that kind of that cluster of viruses, that's been around for a while. He wanted to take some older 144s and then take that 174 from 2016, 2017, and put it into pigs and, and just try to see What's different about all these different viruses? You know, can, what can we really tell if we just put it in some pigs and, and you know, really kind of look at some of those virus, you know, kinetic type of, of uh, differences between them? So, what they did is they brought in all clean pigs, you know, and they brought in two groups. So, they've got like eight pigs here, and here in each one of those, they, these eight pigs, they injected them. So, injected them with the virus and these. And then the, the pen right next to them, they, they brought in pigs that they didn't inject them, but they just let them be so they could have those, those contact with the injected pigs, okay? So these are negative control. They didn't get exposed to any viruses, but here, these are three of the old 144 strains. And then here's that new one, variant 1C strain. And then here's that 174, that last kind of the last, one of the last tougher strains that we had in 2016, 2017. So if you look through those pictures, do you notice anything when you compare those different groups? Anything strike you different about them? This is about six days post-infection. So let me narrow it down for you. Anything different about those two groups? What are they doing? Yeah, they're piling, they're laying there. The other ones, yeah, they got injected the virus, but they're all walking around, running around, eating, you know, no problem, right? So keep in mind of those two groups when we start looking at, at uh, what they found diagnostically when they start looking into these things. So we look at it from a mortality standpoint. The variant 1CC, that's mortality either that were found dead or were euthanized because of welfare concerns. Yeah, I mean, those pigs got hit really hard. These are the ones that were inoculated, so that small pen that was inoculated. They lost six out of eight of those pigs didn't survive to the end of that 14-day uh, period. So they did weigh them at the beginning and then at the end of the evaluation period. So you can see all the inoculated pigs, they pretty much, pretty much lost weight there, right? But the ones that lost the most weight, obviously you can look
look at uh, were the variant one C, so this newest, most newest strain that we're looking at. And that was in the inoculated pigs. If we looked at the, the contact pigs, so the ones that were placed right next to the inoculated pigs, you know, they gained some weight, but certainly those variant one Cs and, and then the 174 there in red, uh, they, they certainly looked at, they didn't gain near as much weight as the other three strains uh, that were inoculated. So they were definitely the ones that grew the slowest. So afterwards, they did euthanize them at the end of that 10-day uh, period, and then they, they took those pigs out and they looked at the looked at those lungs and they, they kind of did an approximation of how much normal, or they looked at how much normal lung and how much diseased lung was left in those pigs. So what this look at here is what percentage of those lungs were, were damaged, right? So here you got for the variant one C was 95% of those lungs were, were damaged with PERS. And then even at the 174, there were about 85% of those lungs were, were impacted. Compared to those older three viruses, they only had about 25 to 40% of those lungs were, were damaged, right? So, you know, we've got this virus, these two more recent viruses, I mean, they just really impact the, the lungs, right? So it makes it really difficult to, to breathe. And, you got 85 to 95% of your lungs are, you know, are damaged with that virus. This one, this counts. Uh, this is looking at the amount of virus in the blood. These differences don't look big, but this is on a logarithmic scale. Okay, so each one, each one of these dots represents another, uh, another million uh, virus particles. So here you got the variant one C. So then, even over the 174, you got a million more virus particles for the variant 1C over the 174, which has got another million virus particles over, over the other ones, right? So you've got these newer strains that just have that much more virus, uh, you know, inside the pig that that, that that pig's immune system has to fight off than these older ones, right? So you can kind of see the difference is why the older strains, those pigs were still up, they're able to walk around, you know, they still had... 60 to 70 percent of their lungs were still functional. They aren't carrying near as much virus as the as the pigs that were infected with these newer strains, right? And then even the contact pigs over here, right? This is looking at how quickly you know that they transmitted, and then how much virus is in there. So you can see there's that purple line again with that variant one C. They got infected quicker, and then at a much higher level with that variant one C than with any of the other strains. So not only does it impact them worse, it also probably spreads a little bit quicker as well. So once again, kind of going back to, to prove that, that hypothesis to say these new strains, they just impact the pig. There's a lot more virus in those pigs. And so it's going to impact them more, which means the mortality is going to be harder to treat and the mortality is going to be a lot higher. Which kind of at the end of the day means we're going to need better tools, we're going to need better vaccines, we're going to need better antivirals, we're going to need better tools in our toolbox than what we got today because the virus is evolving a lot differently uh, than, than what we've had in the past. So we're going to need more tools to really make an impact on this. So this group here, uh, Dr. Len Harris and, and uh, his team here, they, uh, they have access to a bunch, of, uh, a bunch of herds that go through, uh, have done a lot of work looking at PERS outbreak management and have tried different strategies. So they're able to go in and look at these and answer some different questions. Okay, so I just want to share you a little bit of, of what they, some of the analysis they've done. Okay, so this is just looking at uh, some of the questions they've asked in that database. So one was, well, is it better? Uh, what happens in, in terms of how long before the farm gets back to normal production? If you're a negative farm or if you're a positive farm, but stable, right? So that's kind of what you're comparing here. So this is, this, the bottom there is the time in weeks. And then the, the axis here along the left is how long it, or, uh, the probability before you kind of get back to normal production, right? So you can see there the red line. So the ones that have, were previously infected, they got back to normal production quicker than those herds that were completely negative, right? So it just took a little bit longer, which makes sense, right? Herds that were you know, previously infected, they have some immunity. Now it's not completely, we know that's the problem with PERS, right? Is there's not complete cross protection between strains, but some immunity is gonna be better than no immunity at all, okay? So that, that basically kind of confirms what you would expect. So that's looking at time to baseline production, which is essentially saying, how long does it take for my cell farm gets back to 100% of budget production? That's just saying, how long does the break kind of last? 
Another way to look at that is how many pigs did I lose? Okay, so this is total losses per thousand sows. So this is another way of looking at it. So this is the number of piglets lost. So same thing. So in those naive or negative farms, you know, they tend to get hit a little bit harder. So this one says they lost about 6,000 piglets per thousand sows that were naive or negative compared to those that were, you know, previously infected but stable or previously infected and maybe were still unstable. They only lost about 2,500 pigs per thousand sows compared to those that were negative. So Negative farms get hit with a new virus tends to tends to be a little bit worse because they don't really have any immunity, right? Kind of what we would expect to see. So one question that we get sometimes is, okay, well, herd closures can be tough. You know, herd closures, we bring in a bunch of gilts and we close the farm and don't put any gilts in for a while. The idea there is to, cut, to try to create consistent immunity across those herds. But we understand eventually we run out of gilts to breed that way. And, so that, that can create some issues too. So one of the questions uh, you know, that they wanted to look at that database is, does that matter? Do we achieve herd stability fast? And that's a little bit what this TTLP means, to a time to low prevalence. Uh, so that's just measuring processing fluids or, or uh, pre weaned pigs, okay? That's what they're looking at here. So this one says that, yeah, you know, it's, it's uh, if we look at herd closure, yes or no, you look at the yeses, uh, we're probably, uh, we're still getting stabilized if we're doing a herd closure quicker than if we're not doing a herd closure at all. We have a higher probability of achieving a stabilized herd if we're doing a herd closure compared to farms that don't use herd closure as a technique to do that. So maybe going one step further, farms that seek elimination, so they're probably using closure and then they're maybe doing other things like doing a partial depopulation of farrowing, uh, maybe they're washing the hallways in between, you know, they're doing things, they're actually trying to actively eliminate the virus from the farm. Now, it's not saying that they actually did eliminate it, but they're doing additional things on top of herd closure. Does that have a greater success of achieving farm stability? And once again, there, the line that yes is, yep, yeah, there's a little bit higher success, even if they didn't uh, achieve elimination, if they're going through all the extra steps to get to it. They found that those farms achieved stability a lot higher than farms that uh, did not try to uh, seek elimination in terms of trying to get to that stable, stable cell farm production. Does uh, Iowa State have a recommendation on how long to do a closure? Uh, we don't have one per se. It's you know, it's always a balance, right? I mean, longer is better, right? But it's always so much about how you know how much guilt space, you know, it's really how many guilts can you get into the farm. I would tell you that. You know, 10 years ago with those older strains, man, if you could get six to seven months, you know, we, we were really successful a high amount of time. The problem with these newer strains is, man, and, and maybe because we have processing fluids, we have better methods to detect more prevalence. Now it seems like in some cases it's eight, nine months, you know, it's even longer. So I would answer that personally to say, as long as you can, you know, physically, as long as you can stand it or do it, you know, and if you can do some sort of off-site, you know, so you can extend that, period, you know, it, to me, it's as long as you can physically manage it, that's probably going to be the best you can. You know, I remember, geez, the early days, uh, even as, geez, as late as 2008, 2009, in a system that I was working in, and it had some older strains in it. I mean, we closed those herds in five months and completely eliminated it from a 10,000 cell system, but vast, we're dealing with vastly different strains now. If you're, if you're, we didn't do vaccination, we didn't do we didn't do anything other than just closing the farms. But I think the unfortunate thing now is we're just dealing with much more variable strains. You're thinking up to eight or nine months. If, if you can, yeah, like if you can handle it, and it's it's a trade-off, right? It really is between how much production do you want to do you want to give up to try to get that level of stability, you know. That's the unfortunate thing about it. Good question, though. Wish I had a better answer for it. So going back to uh, trying to understand a little bit more about uh, growing pig biosecurity, uh, Dr. Diane presented, she's doing her master's at Iowa State University while she's <laughs> still working as a practicing veterinarian. Uh, she did a study looking at 75 groups of pigs. They were negative for PERS, PED, not vaccinated for PERS, Delta coronavirus, TGE. And she placed those pigs out into uh, Northwest Iowa. So in an area where it had some pig density, and they tracked everything they could on those sites and they tested them every two weeks looking at, they wanted to see, well, how many of those negative pigs that started negative actually made it to the 
the end of the end of the group is still negative, right? And then there, so that that I'm going to show you a little bit of that data, but then they tracked all the biosecurity, who went in and out of that site, trucks went in and out of that site, movements, then you know all the things that happen from a biosecurity standpoint, and they're in the process of, of going through all that data and trying to understand. Uh, uh, what biosecurity events happened that may explain some of those that went positive. So she's still working on that data currently. But here's what they found from that testing. So remember, each one of those 75 groups was tested every two weeks from the time they were placed until they were marketed about 24, 25 weeks later. So from a TG standpoint, didn't find TG, which is not uncommon. Since we have, since we've had PD here, I don't know that, I'm not sure the last TG case that we found. We just really don't see it anymore. PD, she found PD in 15% of those groups. She found Delta coronavirus in about a fourth of them, 26%. And she found PERS in 97% of those groups. So all, virtually all those groups went PERS positive by the time uh, that she marked it up. I think when she showed this data, she still had one group that uh, was still in process. So it still could be, it may have gone up and it finally gets done and gets all published. But, it's amazing. I mean, I've seen data like where they put negative pigs in an area, even five years ago, it was like 50% or 60% went positive. This first one I've seen where it was like virtually 100% of those pigs went positive. So if they look at the distribution of age, I mean, they weren't all filled at the same time. They were staggered and they were probably put, I'm sure, over the fall and winter of 2020, 2021. But interestingly enough, a lot of them were kind of in the, these were way to finish parts were kind of in the midpoint, which I thought was a little bit interesting. I thought more of them would be towards the end when they started marketing pigs out. But like I say, they're, they tracked, they were test them every two weeks. So this is when they found the first positive. So they'll be able to go back and look at, okay, what were all the you know, movements that happened between here and here, right? So that's, once they get all that data summarized, put it in a statistical model, they'll be able to say, were there certain things from a biosecurity standpoint that became risk factors that may explain why some of these sites went positive. That's the, that's the part of the data analysis that she's still working on. But I think at the end of the day for me is to say, you know, boy, we just still have a growing that growing big biosecurity. We got we got some we got some opportunity in that area that hopefully she'll learn some things from her study, you know, that uh, might give us some clues on some areas, what areas we really need to be focusing on. So let's talk a little bit about APP, particularly the serotype 15. That's not a very common one. You know, APP, that was part of the reason why we went to three site production and medicated early weaning, right? We were going to get rid of APP. That was kind of one of the, that was the old Haemophilus pneumoniae. That was one of the major disease causing pathogens that we had before PERS, right? So we were really successful with that. The genetic companies, they got a good serological test. So they, you know, depopulated a lot of their positive herds. You know, we really don't see very many cases, and particularly this serotype 15. I mean, between 2016 and 2020 at Iowa State, we only had 16 cases in, in that uh, five-year period. You know, so we don't see it very commonly at all. Even in 2020, early 2021, we only had five, you know, up until uh, November of 2021. Then all of a sudden, we seem to see a spike. It's kind of a 20-mile radius, so it's really a tight pattern. And it included nine different pig production systems, 19 different sites. We saw this cluster of uh, outbreak and they were all this serotype 15, which is odd because you know, so obviously we had some sort of lateral spread and that's not common for APP at all. You know, viruses, yes, PPD, birds, things like that, but not for APP. So it was kind of up in that sort of neck of the woods, right? So here it is on a weekly basis. You know, you can see we go periods, you know, we might not, or might not go a month without any diagnosis. It's all the APPs in Iowa State, right? And you see we had a few cases in the fall and then kind of getting into that November, December, all of a sudden we started to see a bunch of cases here. Anybody know what happened in about that time period there? <coughs> a little bit hard to see, is it right about the middle of December? Big red is fine. What did Rachel, right? I find that interesting. I just did that. So we've got a, a, a team that's doing outbreak investigations, but when we start getting together and start talking about it, that was one of the things for me to say, wow, you know, I've been involved working with some groups that were in this, down in the Southwestern and the Southern part of the U.S. would talk about, you know, we'd 
have this negative boar stud, you know, be 50 miles away from any other pigs. All of a sudden it will go positive. The only thing would match is, you know, system 50 miles away, but oh yeah, well, they had this big, you know, windstorm two weeks ago and it was, you know, in the same wind direction, right? You know, 50 to 70 mile an hour sustained winds. So I start going, wow, oh, they have that weird derangement, you know, you know. So I don't know, you know, that's they're doing all the outbreak investigation. So they're mapping and they're looking at all that. It'd be interesting to see because just go APP is not one that travels in the wind normally, but I did find that interesting when we kind of map that out. You go, oh, that's kind of interesting, right? So when it, you know, just a kind of a review of APP, what you might see, or you know, what what they did see. I did talk to some producers yesterday. We we're up in north central northeast Iowa. I uh, talked to a producer who, who had did. I don't know if he had one, but he knew somebody that had one. I mean, you see acute death, high fever, you know, dyspnea, so yeah, different difficulty breathing, cyanosis. So that's a purple ears, purple. Toes. So if I didn't tell you anything about APP and you saw those four things, what would that make you nervous about? In the United States in 2022. Anyone? Yeah, there we go. Good job, Washington. My first two ones, I didn't get any response. I'm very happy with the first two stops. Like I'm not doing my job, I'm not making you think about ASM. But yeah. That, that would make me worried. High fever, blue tips, ears, acute deaths. But yeah, these are some pictures I had uh, back in my, my practice days. We had some in some, these are pretty young. Usually it's more of a finishing disease, but these are like 60 pound pigs. And what, what started, what really thought I found was interesting is those pigs would not lay on their sides. They would always lay on their sternum. And it just because I think it was so painful, you could see these lesions. If you post them and you look, you see you got these really black, hardened areas on their lungs. That's very typical for APP. You don't see that always with a lot of other respiratory diseases, but I imagine that must be extremely painful. I mean, those pigs would not lay over. They would just lay on their chest. And that was the only way it was comfortable to lay. You kind of see them laying in the feeder. That was kind of odd. So you, you got kind of get that uh, unique characteristic. Here's kind of what it looks like underneath the microscope. It's actually fairly easy to culture. So if you get anything that looks like that, make sure you're working with your veterinarian. You can get some samples in. It's pretty easy to diagnose from that standpoint. So here's a summary of cases of all those different sites that they worked up. What else did they find? You know, they tested for PERS and mycoplasma, influenza, PCB2. Yeah, they found a couple <clears throat> other things in some cases, but when they look underneath the microscope, it's like this just looks like APP, APP, APP. That's pretty much all it really was. <clears throat> so, like I say, APP, it's really pretty much pig to pig contact. You can maybe do some aerosol spread, but we're talking like short distances, like meters, not kilometers, right? It's pretty, pretty short distance. Like I say, they did a good job of getting rid of them, you know, going to that, you know, that was part of the medicated early weaning. It's one that, you know, if you were, if you were uh, having it from a sows that were positive, you could wean that you can wean pigs and get negative pigs out of positive cells if you wean them young enough, right? It's one that comes uh, late uh, you know, from the south. So, you know, in some of those, maybe, you know, we can kind of move back because it was expensive and we're very good at feeding that really young pig. So, you know, we kind of move back and wean age a little bit. So maybe we see a little bit more now than what we've had before. You know, the maternal antibodies, generally they're pretty good at protecting pigs through the nursery if they're coming from a positive farm, but they'll generally wear off and, and you probably have more at risk at finishers. You probably are really going to see them in the nursery. It's more of a finishing type of disease. You know, some research has been done on, on uh, you know, air transmission. You know, here they said this study, oh, distance maybe out to five kilometers, but oh, well, the employee was moved between sites where the same piece of corn was. Well, that's probably how it was moved, right? Distance, you know, there they say, well, maybe 400 meters if, you know, favorable winds were preceding the outbreak. Well, that's, you know, that's, a, that's not very far. Here are a couple of different studies showing, you know, you know, two and a half meters. This is a risk assessment one. Well, if they're within three kilometers, it was maybe a risk factor, but you know, we still don't know anything about biosecurity in that study. And this one says, well, it doesn't really survive for very long outside the pig. So not like PERS or PE, which in the wintertime can survive for a long period. So we actually have uh, some group that are going into those sites doing outbreak investigations. So hopefully we'll find out what it is, but I'm, I'm, I am a little, I, 
Well, I'd be interested to see, for me, I could see if Case got really high density and he had a couple of finishers that were positive and he had a big wind storm event. I could certainly see how that could, could maybe move it, you know, move it through a bunch of finishers, but we'll see what the outbreak investigation has, and uh, hopefully we'll get something published out of that. It's an antibiotic. That's the good, the good news. So, and, you know, uh, sorry, it's a bacteria. So antibiotics are really effective. Uh, so it's, that's kind of the good news. There's lots of different ones that are effective. You know, if the pigs are near market, Maxell is probably a more common one to use because of the really short withdrawal. You know, if you're a little bit further out, you know, any one of these, Drax and Matrial, XML, Tmulin, Pomatil in the water, those ones have been reported to be pretty successful. It's kind of this question about whether you just spot treat, but you got to go into the barn multiple times a day, right? Because you'll see that pig will be sick. And if you don't catch it right away, it'll be dead in a matter of hours. But if you go through there multiple times a day, you know, I've had several veterinarians, you know, like if you're diligent about it, you know, you can you can just kind of spot treat your way out. You can mass medicate and it'll and it'll be very effective at shutting the mortality down. But if you catch it really early when and the medication wears off, it's going to come back, right? Because the things that have had it, they'll, they'll be recovered. And they'll have immunity to it, but they can still shed the bacteria even though that they're recovered. And pigs that haven't seen it yet, they're still naive to it, right? So they're going to, they're going to get it. So you may have to mass treat a couple of times. Vaccines, if you get the right serotype, is very effective. But for that serotype 15, that's not a common one. So you'd have to, you'd have, to have a strain-specific vaccine uh, for that one. Effective. Anyway, get us uh, closing here. I'll talk a list a little bit about E. coli. This is looking at kind of uh, the cases at uh, ISU BDL from 2007 to 2022. That kind of what we expect to see. Primarily nursery disease, kind of from that four to 10 weeks of, of age range. You know, we kind of see a steady increase here. We've seen more over the last few years, certainly. Um, this is looking at the two more common strains, F18 and K88. So F18, um, there were a lot of cases in the late 90s and early 2000s. Um, F18, that was the one with the edema disease. So you'd hear about 20, 30, 40% nursery mortality with that one, the puffy eyelids, all the edema in the, in the uh, body cavities when you post them. Um, but you know, we had some tools for that. Uh, there was a, some vaccines that were created for that. So you know, we really haven't heard a lot about that lately. So we kind of, if you look in the early 2010, then about 2016, you know, we'd see about the same number of F-18s and K-8s, kind of 2017, 18. Looks like we'd see a little few more F, of F-18. And then really 2020 and 2021, we've really seen an explosion in this F-18 and coli again. So it's almost like it's kind of coming back where the KD8 stayed pretty stable uh, throughout that entire time. So those, those, those fibrial types, whether they're in F18 or KD8, you know, them themselves, they don't really cause the problem. All that means is they attach to certain receptors on the intestines. It's actually their ability to, to give off toxins after they attach the intestines. It's the toxins that actually cause the damage, okay? So if you have one that attaches and it doesn't cause any damage, that doesn't cause any problems. But if it has the shiga toxin and it attaches, that's one that can cause the acute death, diarrhea, and with all this edema disease. Well, if you look back, you know, early on, uh, there was only about a third of those the, the cases that had the F18 that actually had the shiga toxin gene. But now we've seen here more recently with the rise in the F18, we're seeing about two thirds of those cases that actually have the shiga toxin gene too. So uh, thus, uh, we're hearing of more cases of E. coli again. It tends to be a little bit later in the nursery with the F18, more in that 20 to 30 pound range, where we're starting to hear about uh, high mortality associated with F18 E. coli. So, and, and one of the things that really compounds that problem is with a lot of the E. coli's that we're seeing now is they're multi-drug resistant, which means we don't have a lot of antibiotic options anymore. So what you're looking at here is the 2020 BDL sensitivity report. So they take all the E. coli's and they take all these different antibiotics. So each case, if they culture an E. coli, they'll run the sensitivity panel and they'll tell you whether it's sensitive to the antibiotic or resistant. So then this sensitivity report for 2020, they take all those isolates up and they summarize all that data into one chart. So what you're looking at here is the percentages 
So the higher percent, so this is saying like, in this case, genomice and the neomice, they were the two best. So 78, 77% of the E. coli's were sensitive, means, which really just means that they were, were, should be effective against the E. coli's in those cases, but just about everything else, was 50% or less. In some of the cases, it was zero. It was resistant to those complete, right? So kind of says, well, we don't have a lot of tools to treat these E. coli with bacteria. So we're gonna need, we're gonna need to do other things if we're having uh, some challenges with E. coli. We're not gonna be able to just run antibiotics in the water all the time to fix these problems, which is a problem now that we're seeing it, uh, you know, this dramatic increase with FH. So why are we seeing more? There's lots of speculation, what's changed? I think the thing that I, I think I hear most consistently and certainly kind of fits the timing is a change in sireline genetics. So when uh, we had the last F-18 wave in the late 1990s and 2000s, um, you know, there was a lot of Petrin sire lines being used at that time and the genetic companies. So there's actually, uh, there's a genetic marker in that sire line for F-18 resistance. So they were actually including that in part, in part of their selection process, right? So they were trying to select for some F-18 resistance, okay? And they were somewhat successful in that, right? Well, now it kind of feels like over the last two to three years, you know, just because of some of the performance and meat quality characteristics of the Duroc, we're seeing a shift. Now we've got more uh, farms and systems moving over to the Duroc genetics, which has a lot less genetic resistance to, to F18. That's not been a portion of the genetic selection index in the past. So that certainly could be one of the drivers. You know, perhaps something's changed in the F18 E. coli. So there's a group at Iowa State uh, that did an investigation in one of these most recent cases. Because like I, I did mention something about the vaccine and that had worked really well for about 15 to 18 years. And, uh, but all of a sudden in some of these cases, it was like, okay, well, we're having F-18 breaks, but we're vaccinated and we've done all the process and the vaccine looks like it's work, working and it's worked well and we're still having cases. So <clears throat> we've done some of this genetic fingerprinting and looking at the different genes that lo and behold, we found a, a, a different gene that, that hadn't been really found in pigs before, but that has been found in humans that's involved in the attachment of of E. coli into the intestines, right? Now, that could just be an incidental finding or it may mean something. We're in the process of trying to do some additional testing to find that out. But, you know, that is certainly is a hypothesis something could have changed with that E. coli. Obviously, because of, you know, changes in pricing and supply chain disruption, we've had a lot of changes in, in the feed ingredients as well. So that could be all rolled up into part of this as well. Dr. Greiner is one of our nutritionists. So I just asked, you know, hey, got some producers are having challenges, what are some things that they can do about it? You know, some of her suggestions from a dietary standpoint would be consider, you know, one of the things that a lot of producers went to is really simplifying those nursery diets. She says, well, maybe you want to go back to maybe a four phase diet with that third phase, keeping a lower level of zinc. You know, very common for the first couple of phases to have, you know, high levels, 2,500 to 3,000 per uh, PPM of zinc oxide. She said, because, F18 hits a little bit later, you may want to have that third phase with a lower level, maybe 1200 ppm of zinc oxide to uh, help because zinc oxide will, will help keep that E. coli from, from really growing. You know, in the past, rolled oats, you had some rolled oats in the diets or rice hulls has been really good in those early diets. You said you may want to consider having a lower level in that third phase as well. Uh, just be aware that putting those rolled oats in there will certainly have an impact on average daily gain. Utilizing some organic acids. So acidifying that lower gut, once again, that will help, that will prevent that E. coli from growing so fast. So using protect, it's not necessarily, this is, I think, feed ingredient she's talking about. You got to use a protected or encapsulated acid so it makes it through the stomach and gets down into the lower intestines. Um, but she said that those have been reported to have some success with it. And just reducing the amount of, uh, you know, crude protein or soybean meal in those diets can. Can help with that as well. Trying to keep the, the amount of soybean meal till about those pigs get you know to that 35, 40 pounds and kind of get past that range, but just reduce the amount of crude protein if you're having F18 uh, coli challenges. And then you know once again as we got to old, eating older pigs, we started pulling the plasma out of the early diets. 
some people have had some luck by going back to plasma in those early diets, try to get you know some more feed intake into that pig that first week, uh, rather than get just that uh, pig skin all that E. coli uh, into that gut instead. Try to make sure get the more feed intake we get in that first week, the less uh, more protected those pigs seem to, uh, seem to be. Some other management techniques is try to make sure that they get the appropriate amounts of phase one and phase two. I know it's really common sometimes to put phase one in the bed and then dump phase two right on the top. Well, invariably those wind up getting mixed. So some people have had challenges with that. You know, so I've seen some people do that. They'll actually you know, go in and feed all that phase one out into each of the beds first and then put the phase two in the bed to try to prevent some of that mixing. Get those pigs up, you know, the sooner they eat, once again, you know, go back to that plasma discussion. The sooner they eat, the more they eat that first week, the better off they're going to be. Get them up three to four times a day and maybe even put an attractant in there. You know, keep that heat source near the feeder. Make sure they eat this time of year. Help them try to make sure they find water those first couple of days. That's really important. Uh, some people have had some luck putting, once again, citric acid in the water. Once again, try to acidify that in that gut, prevent that E. coli from growing. Some people have had some luck with creek feeding and farrowing just to help get that gut. Uh, acclimated before uh, clean those pigs out. So last slide before I turn it over to Dr. Schultz, just want to talk a little bit again about that U.S. SHIP program. So what it is and, and where this is a little bit different than the past, it's really kind of the beginning of a nationalized plan. Uh, and it's really modeled after the National Poultry Improvement Plan, okay? So that, uh, that National Poultry Improvement Plan, that's been around since 1935, okay? The neat thing about that is that is an industry, state, and federal partnership. So you've got the feds and the state officials and the poultry industry all working together. Okay, so that that program has been around, you know, coming up on ninety years. So, so you know, the, the federal they're they're really familiar with it. They understand how that works. So we're really just taking that one, that program, and then trying to apply it to pigs, right? So we're Thinking about that from an ASF and CSF standpoint, you know, really kind of starting about, about biosecurity, traceability, and disease surveillance, really working on the prevention of an FAD from, from you know initially, but also on the backside is if we do get an FAD, how do we how do we quickly uh, utilize a program like this to get you know to get ourselves back and get uh, get our pork back and you know uh, back out to our trading partners. So. You know, the, it's a pilot program sponsored by USDA. We've got all 28 of the largest pig production states are on board. You know, producers, it's a voluntary sign up. All you got to do is fill out a biosecurity survey, work with your state agencies. Uh, no cost to you guys to participate. You're going to hear a lot more from Corey and his team in the upcoming months. So I just want to give you a little bit of overview with that. <music>